Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, Eddie, thank you very much. And to the Hispanic Chamber and the Chamber and all the other sponsors, we're so uh, pleased to have the opportunity to be with you today. Whoa. Another hand for these three U.S. Senators who have given us some time today. Appreciate your being here. It will probably come as a surprise to you that I thought we might start with Todd Aiken. As the news of the week has unfolded uh, and the focus of the country has turned to this subject, I wanted to begin by reporting on a poll that I saw this morning, Senator Cornyn, you is the person who is most responsible for trying to win back Republican control of the Senate next time. Uh, a poll out by the Rasmussen Reports organization, a Republican-leaning organization, it's believed, has Senator McCaskill, as of this morning, up on Congressman Aiken, 48-38, a 10-point lead or a 21-point shift in this uh, race as of the last seven or 10 days. You were one of those who spoke out early to ask Congressman Aiken to get out of that race. I want to talk less about what he said than about the implications politically. Can you win that race, Senator, and are you still hoping that Congressman Aiken gets out? Well, thanks for the question, Evan. I knew you'd come up with something interesting to start with, <laughs> uh, something provocative. But, yeah. But the, um, I don't believe uh, Congressman Aiken can win that race. And there's been a call across the board for him to withdraw and allow the uh, uh, Missouri GOP to select an alternative candidate who can win. As you know, the uh, race for the majority in the Senate is very hotly contested nationwide. <coughs> Republicans need a net of four seats. And that was one of the ones where I believe we had uh, one of our greatest opportunities. But as you point out, the Rasmussen poll uh, indicates that uh, Congressman Aiken uh, could not win. Uh, where the election held today, nor do I think that's going to change much. And so um, I hope he does the right thing. Um, it's been, it hasn't been a debate between the establishment, and the Tea Party, or any uh, sort of divisions that we commonly think of now within the Republican ranks. But uh, so I, I hope he does the right thing. I expect him to do so, uh, although I can't tell you exactly when. But the mechanism, Senator, for him to get out and to be replaced has gotten infinitely more complicated. If he had gotten out on the very first day or the second day, it would have been easier for you all to replace him. You're correct. And uh, I guess two days ago, he could have withdrawn by 5 o'clock, uh, basically, without uh, any uh, intervention by court or anyone else. Uh, now, up to five weeks before the election, he could withdraw with permission of the court. But it's not like Texas, where I believe you can substitute the candidate on death or disability of the candidate. Here, it's uh, pretty automatic. It said it shall be freely given uh, yeah. the permission by the court. But, of course, if there's a cost to reprinting ballots or things like that, that's, uh, that right. could be a fact. Senator but, Coburn, Congressman Aiken's position on this this week has been the people of Missouri who voted in that Republican primary chose me. They didn't choose the other candidates, and if the party's uh, 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 leaders, GOP's leaders, want me out, they're uh, going to be thwarting the will of the people of Missouri. Do you share that point of view? Uh, no, I don't, because I, if I recall, he got about 35 percent of the vote. <clears throat> so over two-thirds of the Republicans in the state of Missouri did not vote for him. Uh, you know, I think it's reflective of what we see in terms of careerism in Washington. Uh, the politicians are so invested in their political career that they don't see the long term and the better benefit. Right. And if uh, <clears throat> Congressman Aiken really believes in the principles that he espouses, what he'll want is a long term success for those beliefs rather than a short term political consequence that's going to hurt those beliefs. So if Congressman Aiken, Senator Coburn, were to call you and say you're one of the most popular conservatives in the Senate, we want you to come to Missouri and campaign on my behalf, you will turn him down? Absolutely. Senator Vitter, same thing, you would turn Congressman Aiken down if he I, asked you to come campaign? I would, and what I think is really a shame, not just for Republicans, but for the political debate, is uh, this is a huge distraction from the issues, from the conversation, from the debate right. the American people want, issues right. that matter, uh, right. issues that American and Texas and Louisiana families talk about around their kitchen table. And quite frankly, that's why the left is so excited about it, because yeah. they need a distraction. They don't particularly want to talk about the economy and the issues American families are really focused on. Right. Senator, to, to Congressman, uh, pardon me, to Senator Vitter's point with regard to Congressman Aiken, going into the convention on Monday, we now have the country engaged in a conversation about rape and about abortion as opposed to the economy, which is not what Republicans had hoped would be the case. Is that true? Yes, that's true. And uh, 
We know this election is about jobs and the economy and about the president's, uh, unfortunately, I failed policies of the last four years. Uh, and we know that uh, President Obama has finding it very difficult to run on his track record. And so that's why I agree, Senator Bitter, with Senator Bitter, you tend to have uh, more of the, the personal attacks and the distractions rather than to talk about those issues. And, right. and we still don't know what, uh, what a second Obama term would look like. It's not really laid out an alternative vision, um, but uh, I'm, I'm glad that we're going to have a serious debate about the real issues uh, with uh, Paul Ryan being selected as a vice presidential candidate, a, a choice that I would call a high risk, high reward. Mm -hmm. But I think the country has, has moved and has, the conversation has matured. So I think uh, thanks to the efforts of people like Tom Coburn, uh, who served on the uh, Simpson Bowles Commission, the so-called gang of six, the bipartisan attempt to try to come to a consensus on solutions to the nation's biggest problems. I think the American people are ready for that, and I think that's what we ought to be focusing on. And Evan, yes, let me Senator. just add, th this distraction might continue at least for a while in Missouri. I don't think it's going to continue nationally because right. the major challenges American families face are right. so important. And I think they're going to be looking for real answers to those major challenges. To, to that point, Senator Vitter, let me ask you about the larger implication of this, because I agree with you, Congressman Aiken will fade as a discussion point in the national conversation, but the issue of women and the Republican Party is going to be ongoing as we get to Election Day. Over the last couple of days, there have been uh, a number of polls out that have shown the difference between the President and Governor Romney on women. Uh, Governor Romney is behind the president in Pennsylvania on women by 24 points, in Wisconsin by 20 points, in Ohio by 19 points. Can the Republicans win this presidential election if the gap is that large between Governor Romney and President Obama on women? If the gap is that large on election night, probably not. Yeah. Uh, I'm very hopeful it's not going to be, particularly after Labor Day when all sorts of folks, men, women, uh, focus on the key issues in their lives. I think they're, they're going to look at what solutions are being put forward. And I think most Americans are going to see this campaign from the left to distract as just that. Right. Uh, and they're going to be looking from all sides, from all parties, for real, honest solutions. Senator Coburn, let me ask you about the other group that is going to be relevant to winning this election and having that economic conversation, and that's Latinos. Here we are in San Antonio. The San Antonio Hispanic Chamber is one of the presenting groups of this event. And the NBC News, Wall Street Journal, Univision poll this week had President Obama leading Governor Romney among Latinos 63 to 28, a 35-point gap. Can Governor Romney win the election if that gap doesn't close, in your mind? Oh, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. Uh, I'm not very good at uh, 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 predicting election outcomes. Everybody right. I've ever endorsed ended up losing, so I'm not, you know, I'm not very good. <laughs> Right. Good at it. I, you know, I think the, the, the question, you know, it goes back to the question you asked David and the question you asked me is, what's the future about? Right. Uh, uh, right now, our country's at risk. Uh, matter of fact, when the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff says the greatest risk for our country has nothing to do with any foe outside of the country but is our debt. Yep. And we have an administration that will not address that, will not lay out true character-based, courageous, visionary leadership. Americans are used to doing hard things, uh, but they only do it if they see visionary leadership. Yep. And so when you ask about women, what, what, one of the most important things for women is to secure the future for their kids. Right. And what we're doing right now uh, by not addressing the real issues is we're putting our kids in shackles. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think we can easily bring back that component. I, I think if, if the Hispanic community looks at policies that build and, and, and restore growth to our country and restore opportunity, I think they'll come along. Uh, I don't know what the numbers show, uh, but I do know that if you follow principle instead of people, yeah. uh, what you're going to do is see people line up behind that. Now, Senator Cornyn, you have in a state that will soon be Hispanic majority been having a version of this conversation for many years. We've, in fact, had it before. Make the case to Latinos in the audience who may not be with the Republican Party right now that they should be. Can you make that argument? Well, I think uh, what's most important to the Hispanic community is economic empowerment. And by that, I mean education, which is the key that unlocks the door, and the opportunity to work hard, uh, care for their family, and build something, and uh, in the process, create jobs and prosperity, not only for themselves, but for uh, their children and future generations. 
And uh, so I don't think this is a, a, a narrow, I think this is a broad uh, issue with the Hispanic community. And there are many things that, uh, that I think we, we find in common and agree upon. Uh, there are difficult issues like how do we solve the broken immigration system, which the president, by his executive order, has not fixed. Indeed, he's added further complication to it. Um, and so I think there is a, a broad opportunity to have that conversation in places like this today yep. in San Antonio, but also continuing engagement to work together to say how do we, how do we, uh, how do we, uh, how do we make sure the American dream, which has attracted immigrants from uh, to this country for the last 200 years, how do we make sure the American dream is alive for present and future generations? And that means. To me, uh, how do you revive the free enterprise system? Government is not the solution that most immigrants are looking for. Many of them have fled oppressive governments in places where they've had no opportunity to come to the United States where the free enterprise system and the freedoms we enjoy have provided that opportunity. And that's something I think we need to continue to, uh, to uh, talk about. Now, we are changing out the microphones, Eddie. Is that what I understand? what happens in 90% how you react to it. So we're going to try to react real quick and switch out the microphones. Okay, uh, if you'll give us 30 seconds here, okay? we're going to do that real quick. Thank you. Senator Vitter, I will ask you a question while you're getting your microphone here. Sure. Uh, to, to the point that you've all made today that really whatever uh, political question I ask, it all comes back to the economy. Let me, let's, let's jo join that right now. Uh, uh, obviously the case that's going to be made for the next few months up to the election and should Governor Romney win, should the Republicans take control of the Senate, I think especially after that, is that we have to reform the way that we think about the economy of this country. Could you talk about what exactly you think is wrong with the economy currently and what you would like to see be the first couple of things that a new Romney administration or a Republican controlled Senate might do to solve those problems? Uh, well, I think the last four years is about President Obama being handed a very tough situation, uh, a bad economy coming out of the financial crisis, but then enacting policies that have consistently made it worse. And we have to remember the first two years of his presidency, President Obama had everything he wanted, House, Senate, the White House. He passed every major agenda item he asked for, and that made it worse and not better. And fundamentally, it made it worse because I think it imposed too much government interference and regulation. That was a burden on the economy. I think a conservative sweep would lead to a very different policy to unleash the power of American ingenuity, individual businesses not be so dependent and focused on American government. If it were... Can be specific. I'd like to sure, be specific. I'll be... I'll be specific in two areas. One thing I care about, which a lot of Texans care about, is American energy. We're the single most energy-rich country in the world, bar none. For instance, far richer than Saudi Arabia in total energy resources. Problem is we're the only country in the world that takes well over 90% of those resources and puts them off limits and says no, 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 no. Nothing off the East Coast, nothing off the West Coast, nothing in the Eastern Gulf, almost nothing offshore Alaska, absolutely nothing in Anwar, nothing right now in the western states where there's enormous shale deposits. No, 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 no. If we reverse that in a uh, safe, responsible way, we could grow great American jobs and energy independence and federal revenue to lower deficit and debt. Second very specific thing I hope we focus on is dramatic fundamental tax reform. Let's get beyond this old, stale, stuck-in-the-mud debate about the top tax rates. And let's have dramatic simplification that broadens the base and lowers rates for everyone, starting with American business. We have the highest corporate tax rate in the world, bar none. Small businesses that pay through the individual rate have the highest rate in the world, bar none. So we could have dramatic simplification, make the code fairer, simpler, everybody pay something, even GE, everyone, and uh, raise more money because it's going to lead to growth and rev up the economy. So your position, Senator, that reforms, the, you're talking, the kind of reforms talk about will take time. 
for the time being, the looming question is, do the Bush tax cuts persist? And your response well, to that first, is? Well, first of all, I don't think they have to take beyond, say, the first half of 2013. Right, but you're going to have, have, have a deadline that you're going to have to hit at the end the will, of the year. Right. But should tax rates go up in the middle of a horrible economy? No, absolutely not. By the way, that's exactly what President Obama said two years ago when the growth rate was higher right. than it is now. Senator Coburn, I suspect that you're with Senator Vitter on the question of tax rates not going up. Is that right? Well, I think you, ha you have to look at history. <clears throat> the last time we had a major reform to the tax code, we had the largest expansion in our history post-World War II. Uh, with average 4.6% real GDP for four years in a row. <clears throat> that potential's there. Uh, and, and tax reform isn't as hard as, ever, as the political class and the media makes it say. The, the, the easy way to do that is you sunset the present tax code. And, and you do that, and in six months you force uh, reform of the tax code. The, 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 problem, the problem we have, Evan, is there's 2.8 2 to $2.9 trillion sitting idle right now in American businesses. And historically, there's about $800 billion to a trillion. If, if you want to have a stimulus for this country, what you have to have is certainty and confidence about the future. And I would tell you the biggest problem, what this election is really about is, is there a vision for America? that will return us to the growth. And if you add in what David just said, the carbon atom is the basic building block for everything we use. And when America, through shell gas, even if you double the price of gas tomorrow, we still beat everybody else in the world by 50%. You're talking about an engine of economic growth based on energy that would put us back on top and growing for the next 50 years. So the combination of tax reform that allow the investment to happen that creates wealth, when it's sitting in a bank account, it's not doing anything. It's not creating a job, it's not doing anything. In combination with energy. But there, there's actually a third thing that we need to do. We have at least $300 billion of programs, duplication, fraud and waste that the federal government runs every year that doesn't really help anybody. I mean, it, 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 we intended to help anybody, but the, when you go out to measure the metrics on it, the performance on it, there's no accomplishment with it. So, so the only benefit we get is the people employed in the effort to offer it. Changing all of that, refining and streamlining that, including the Pentagon, uh, will actually buy us tons of additional capital to be invested in our economy. I want to come back to the Pentagon in a second. Uh, go to Senator Cornyn with this question of tax reform and the tax rates. You know, President Clinton has said many times on behalf of President Obama, well, when I was president, the upper tax rate was higher than it was during President Bush. And during my eight years, we had an extraordinary economic uh, growth, recovery, full employment, you know, employment and all that under President Bush, not so much. Therefore, the conclusion to draw is that it's not uh, tied necessarily to the height of the tax rate and that's this idea that somehow if you raise taxes on the upper income folks in this country that it's going to be cataclysm well that's been disproven he would say by his eight years what do you say to that Evan if I can just quickly uh, jump in President Clinton more recently about six weeks ago said we shouldn't raise anyone's rates in this economy two days later his Treasury Secretary Larry Summers said we shouldn't raise anyone's rates in this economy. So I do not think he would jump to the suggestion you're talking about in terms of this present debate. But Senator and Senator Cornyn, President Clinton has observed nonetheless that the 39% tax rate while he was president was not a disincentive to growth. I'm just wondering if you could talk about the relationship between, Senator Vitter's not wrong about that, but I want to ask if you could talk about that. Well, a lot of people say a lot of things in Washington, D.C., and uh, unfortunately they're uh, not necessarily always consistent, but I'll give President Clinton credit. He presided over the last, uh, last budget uh, where we actually had a balanced budget, had Republican majorities in the House and the Senate, and uh, he was President of the United States. So I'll give him some credit for that. Uh, but what it takes is leadership. What I was perhaps most disappointed about was after the Simpson-Bowles Commission report came out, the bipartisan attempt to try to come up with a, a big step toward the right solution in terms of debt reduction, in terms of tax reform, in terms of all the things we've been talking about here today, the president walked away from it and uh, he really hasn't been heard to speak on it since. And it's, if it had been Bill Clinton, and I think this is what I was hoping he would do after the 
2010 election, which by all accounts was pretty tough on Democrats, is to say, you know, I'm going to do what Bill Clinton would do. I'm going to become a pragmatist, not an ideologue, and I'm going to sit down and figure a way to work with this bipartisan consensus. And you know what? It would have helped him politically because it would have done something important and something uh, substantive and a bipartisan basis to solve a real problem. And uh, I think that probably would have helped uh, President Obama more than anything else. But as I said, I'm disappointed to say he walked away from it when uh, he gave a speech at Georgetown shortly after the uh, Simpson-Bowles Commission report came out. Paul Ryan was sitting in the front row and he used it at the occasion to attack Paul Ryan for his attempt to try to come up with a plan to solve some of these same problems. Not a perfect plan, but I think a plan beats no plan almost every time, at least as a starting point, and that's what uh, I, I think uh, we all found so uh, disappointing. Senator Coburn. Yeah, I just think there's a little history that has been forgotten. Uh, in 1995, the Republicans took control of Congress. The first time an appropriation rescission bill has been passed since World War II. $67 billion was cut in 1995. You put that on the glide path. The reason we had a balanced budget in 2000, and it was $36 billion, the true general accepted accounting principles, the reason we did is because of the cumulative effect of that $67 billion became over $270 billion a year by 2007, I mean by 2000. The second point is we had a wonderful tech bubble in 2000 where you had capital gains taxes flowing into the Treasury like we've never seen. And that was brought forward by the year 2000, Y2K, remember that? All the per advanced purchasing that we saw, we saw a recession in 2001. We saw that recession not because, necessarily because of 9-11. We were into it before that because of the fact that we had forward purchased just like we did automobiles when we had the cash for clunkers. So the Republican Congress under, Pre under President Clinton was instrumental in getting us to where we needed to be. Absolutely, and President right. Clinton deserves some, because right. he signed that, he, he signed that right. rescission package. So Senator Vitter, the trick to recovering the economy is to have a Republican Congress and a second-term Democratic president? I, uh, I, I don't think that's the conclusion we were driving toward. I think we're focused imagine on, that. I think we're focused on the policy, which needs to be pro right. growth policy to unleash uh, the energy of American business, not keep it under wraps. So you know, the Re Republicans have, in fact, Senator, according to your point, boxed the president's ears with the failure to pick up the Simpson Bowles baton for the last couple of years. Right now, are you telling me that if the president decided in September to say, "I've tried everything; it hasn't worked. I've heard my Republican friends on the Hill." I am going to fully get behind Simpson Bowles, and since they have been for Simpson Bowles for so many years, I'm sure they're going to join me there. That you all will be yes votes for Simpson Bowles? Well, we know Tom Coburn voted for it, and Tom's got one of the most conservative voting records in the United States. That's Senate. right. And uh, of course, uh, others haven't had a chance to vote on it and weigh in, but I do think it would be remarkable. I think uh, uh, we've been waiting for that to happen, but uh, to no avail. And. As you know, Evan, the uh, Congressional Budget Office just came out with its estimate that this country will be in a recession in 2013 unless Congress steps in to deal with tax Taxmageddon, the expiration of all these tax provisions, which would result in one of the largest tax increases in American history, in addition to the sequestration, which, of course, uh, San Antonio being Military City USA understands the impact of another half a trillion dollars cut out of defense spending something that Secretary Panetta, the President's own Defense Secretary, said it would be devastating and would hollow out the military. So we're waiting for President Obama uh, to step up and uh, so far to no avail. S uh, Senator Vitter, to the Ryan plan, which Senator Cornyn brought up and has become a very big part of the conversation since uh, Congressman Ryan was chosen as Governor Romney's running mate, the Democrats want you Republicans to own the Ryan plan. Do you, will you, should you? I voted for it several times, and I was proud to do that. I voted for other somewhat different but generally similar plans right. uh, several times. So yes, uh, but I think we have to have a real substantive adult debate about it, which I don't think the president wants to have. First of all, uh, he's, it's a free country, and he's open to criticize the Ryan plan. I think to be credible in doing that, he should have an Obama plan, and he doesn't. And he never has. And he's never had a full substantive plan to really deal with entitlements and save 
Social Security and Medicare, because ultimately that's what it's about. Are we going to save these programs? Secondly, if we have a full, honest discussion about it, I think he needs to admit, including to seniors, that the Ryan plan doesn't touch in any negative way anyone who's retired or about to retire. Rule one of the Ryan plan yeah. is that those 55 and older live under the present system with no negative changes, and yet the attacks from the left are focused on seniors trying to scare them right. into thinking otherwise. But, but, but nor, uh, 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 Senator Vitter, does the Ryan plan balance the budget for how many years, how many decades? I mean, it does, takes a long time for the Ryan plan to actually achieve what you all think should be achieved much sooner. That is correct. That's why I actually prefer one thing we worked on in the Senate, Senator Toomey's budget, right. which leads to a balanced budget uh, much more quickly. Uh, uh, Senator Coburn, Dr. Coburn, I, I, at, at the risk of raising another issue here, Senator Vitter says that, well, the president doesn't like the Ryan plan, but he hasn't offered anything as an alternative. Couldn't the Democrats say that that's exactly what you've done with the Affordable Care Act, the Republicans have done? We don't like Obamacare. Not at all. What, what have you all proposed as an alternative? No, well, first of all, let's get history straight. There was, a, the, 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 there was called the Patient's Choice Act by myself and 26 other Republicans that was never allowed a vote on the Senate floor, which was a consumer-oriented, market-based solution to health care in this country that would have saved hundreds of billions of dollars and allowed people the freedom to choose and keep their health insurance. So, so we, do, we have had a plan. The, the question, there's multiple plans out there. The, the problem is, is we have specifics. And here's the thing that I think we should emphasize. There's two areas in our economy where we don't trust markets at all. There is no market in healthcare today. Insurance isn't insurance, it's prepaid medical expense for which we all pay a high fee. We don't truly indemnify risk. So we don't have it, and we have no connection. And the reason that one out of every three dollars in healthcare doesn't help anybody get well and doesn't prevent them from getting sick is because there's no connected b connection between payment purchase because we all think somebody else is paying for our medical bills. And it, it doesn't matter who's president or who's in Congress until you readjust that mechanism to where some, we have some personal responsibility for our own health care in terms of some connection to payment. Uh, great statistics. If you're a Medicare patient and you have a supplemental policy versus a Medicare patient that doesn't, on the same, every, every, they have exactly the same outcomes, but somebody with a supplemental policy consumes 23% more Medicare dollars. So the point is, is we've abandoned markets in education and healthcare. There isn't any true markets, and if you ever want, no matter whose idea it is, if you ever want to control it, you're gonna to have to have some market forces on it and some change in behavior. The second point, and, and I, I would say this, Nobody can criticize Paul Ryan's plan to fix Medicare until they stand up and say, here's my plan. Nobody. They have no credibility whatsoever, not the president or anybody else, until they're willing to be specific in terms of how they would solve it. So the, the, we're, we're going to be treated. I, I knew this wasn't a meeting of the committee to reelect the president, and now I have that confirmed. Um, <laughs> Uh, Senator uh, Cornyn, to the point of the Ryan plan, we are going to be treated fairly or unfairly over the next four months to ads featuring Congressman Ryan throwing old people out of windows. I mean, that is going to be the, to the Ryan plan and Medicare and everything else, that's going to be the, the way this is sold to people by the Democrats. Well, unfortunately, uh, I mean, that's one of the, some of the apprehension among the, uh, among the uh, political consultants and the, and the establishment in Washington to uh, Congressman Ryan's nomination or selection because people were nervous about this because politically this has been one of the third rails of American politics. But I do believe, as I said earlier, that people are ready now for a more adult conversation. The country has been, um, has moved and understands that now if we do nothing, which apparently is, is President Obama's plan, that uh, Medicare and Social Security are going to become insolvent. And so this is an alternative that I think needs to be debated. But I, I thought that uh, the Romney campaign actually was pretty smart about the way they started this debate. They pointed out the first thing, that, um, that the president's health care bill took $716 billion out of Medicare in order to fund the president's health care bill. So 
Do you, uh, you, do you know, that's in dispute, Senator. The, uh, the, a lot of the news organizations after those ads came out have challenged whether those facts are accurate. That's, uh, CBO that's CBO that's number. CBO. I think it's a CBO that's number. Now, as a friend of ours, uh, Bob Bennett, who used to serve in the Senate, liked to say, he said, uh, one thing you, I can tell you for sure is that CBO number is wrong. I can't tell you if it's too high or too low. But I think that comes from a credible source. And it's a fact that uh, Medicare Advantage, which covers a whole lot of seniors, which is an alternative, it's a private sector alternative to fee-for-service Medicare, was cut dramatically, you can argue maybe about the numbers, exact numbers, to, in order to pay for a new entitlement program. So you took something that was already an unsustainable path to create yet a new entitlement program, which we can't afford. Uh, the, the defense has come up, Senators, a number of times in this conversation. This is San Antonio, this part of the state, as in your states as well, Senators, cares enormous about, enormously about the defense industry. You referenced, Senator, uh, half a trillion dollars. I think it's 55, 50 to 55 billion a year for 10 years. Is that the defense? In addition, what's already in there? Um, if you were to get rid of, let's hear the case for not making those defense cuts from a, a national security standpoint. And then from a budget standpoint, let me ask as a follow-up, if you're not going to cut there, where will you cut? Because obviously, if you lose those cuts, you're going to have to make them up somewhere else. What are you prepared to do? Senator first, and then we'll go down the panel. Well, Dr. Coburn has been uh, one of the leaders in the Senate to call for an audit of the Defense Department. And uh, with all the money that the Defense Department is spending, um, I think there's good reason to believe they have not been able to keep track of all of their spending. In fact, cannot produce an auditable financial statement. Uh, we hope to change that, and it's very important to reestablishing credibility to make sure that people understand the money that's put in defense goes to national security and isn't just uh, frittered, frittered away. But I would just uh, go back to uh, the President's own Secretary of Defense, uh, Leon Panetta, who said that this would be, these would be devastating cuts. And we know that this is not happening in a vacuum. Uh, recently, I was in London visiting with British members of parliament. The British army is being cut by 20% because of austerity measures in that country. So their ability to contribute forces to NATO um, and is, uh, are going to be limited. And we need to look at what is the mission and let that determine what the budget is. Not determine what the budget is and then say, okay, now let's see what we can cobble together in terms of the mission. So I think, I think the administration has it exactly backwards. Senator Vitti, you're opposed to these cuts? Uh, I'm, a, I'm in support of the overall number. I'm opposed to the mix, which is too heavy on defense. So let me back up. Number yeah. one, I think we should stick to this level of cuts and not back off this quite modest the total. start. Correct, the yeah. total. This quite modest start actually, in terms of getting spending under control. But the argument that we should rearrange the mix is, is quite simple. It's that defense is 17 percent of the federal government, of the federal budget, and is getting 50 percent of the cuts. Uh, and that's out of whack and too much. Uh, I'm on a bill, a very specific alternative bill, led by John McCain, that would replace that with two simple things, extending the federal employee pay freeze that President Obama has instituted, which we can afford to extend because federal employee compensation is out of whack, quite frankly, with the private sector, and number two, uh, an attrition plan so that uh, out of uh, every three federal employees who leave service, we only replace two until we downsize federal employment by 5 percent. Again, 5 percent is very Modest well, can you make up 50 to $55 billion a year in projected defense cuts in the ways that you're talking about? Yes, you can. You can. S uh, Senator Coburn, do, uh, you, you have been a huge advocate for those kinds of audits that Senator Cornyn is talking about. Of course, the problem with the need for an audit didn't begin in this administration. It goes back. This is institutionalized, isn't it, going backwards? Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, since my first degree is accounting, I like to actually look at real numbers rather than fake numbers. Okay. Uh, the, the, the first thing I is, like is the first half trillion dollars in cuts is a decrease in the increase. So it's not a real cut. You know, it's the, it's the way Washington talks about cuts. Uh, the second thing is, is you can have a military with exactly the same number of troops that we have today, the same number of planes, the same number of ships, or increasing and the same t number of Coast Guard, National <clears throat> Guard troops, everything else, same force structure we have and still take a half a trillion dollars out of the Defense Department. The problem is, 
is people don't want to look at the specifics. And let me just give you a couple of specifics. Please. We spend $44,000 a year on on-base schools to educate per child in the military. You could take $14,000, give it to the local school district to run your school, save $30,000 per kid that's in every one of them. You have 88,000 soldiers working in the Pentagon at rates and, and benefits that's higher than what you could hire it done by the private sector, and you could transfer those 88,000 to actually force. You can go all through the Pentagon. It doesn't matter where it is. Weapons procurement, the easy way to solve the weapons procurement problem. If you want a no-bid contract, then you put up half the capital if, you're, if it's a major weapons production system. Therefore, you're invested in any cost overruns. Half of it comes out of your yeah. pocket. So we, we, we lack grown-ups. We have great ideas. We have great defense. I'm a defense hawk. But the defense department, as constituted today, has no grown-ups in the room when it comes to controlling how you spend money because they can't measure it. And what you can't measure, you cannot manage. And so it doesn't matter. They've been trying since 1976 to get an audit. The Marine Corps is very close to that. Uh, I'd make one final point. We just finished a study. The average per hourly compensation for a federal employee fully absorbed is $59.88 an hour. The average private sector compensation is $28.76 an hour. So at more than double in terms of fully absorbed cost for federal employees. So what David says is realistic in terms of what the benefit package and the payment is. Is the stomach there in the Senate as well? I mean, you talk about how there's no grown-ups in the Defense Department. Senator, are senators whose home states are going to be impacted by some of the cuts that would result from Senator Coburn's audit, they're going to be able to go back home and sell those reductions on the basis of good government to their constituents? I don't think we have any choice. Um, I, I'm with David Vitter, and I know with Tom Coburn as well. We need to begin to rein in federal spending, but it shouldn't come disproportionately out of the bone and muscle of our defense spending. If, it's not just one of a cafeteria plan of things that we spend money on. This is the number one responsibility of the federal government, national security. And there's a lot of other things that the government does that simply we need to trim and we can, uh, we can save money on. But yeah, I think we have no choice. Let me, uh, I, I'm going to ask for uh, Tom Coburn to help me here a little bit, but I, I think it's, you know, we're, we're experiencing low interest rates on our bonds that we, uh, that we have to pay, interest we have to pay to our creditors, mainly China, to buy those bonds, thanks to Ben Bernanke and the Federal Reserve. If those interest rates that we have to pay on our national debt and 40 cents out of every dollar is currently being borrowed that the federal government's spending today, if we have a 1% increase on what we have to pay on our bonds to our creditors, I believe over 10 years it's $1.7 trillion. And so you can see if we have a 2% increase over historically low interest rates, if they get up to 3% or 4%, all of this we're doing in terms of cuts is insignificant. And we could spiral out of control, which is the reason why many people believe that what's happening in Europe now will in fact happen to the United States unless we responsibly step up and deal with this and, soon. And, and that's not a question of if, that's a question of when. I mean, we, we can't sustain these historically right. unbelievably low interest rates forever. So it's just a question of when. We need to get ahead of that curve. We're going to open it up for questions from the audience here for the balance of our time in one second. But I want to ask one last question of the three senators up here. According to the NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, the approval rating of the American people for Congress is 12 percent. Congratulations, that's higher than it's been. So the good, the good news is that the approval rating of Congress is 12 percent. What's wrong with you guys or what's wrong with us guys that we don't perceive appropriately the work that you're doing in the right vein? Well, let me start out. I would say the good thing that we don't run as Congress on the ballot, we run as individuals and people tend to have a little higher regard, hopefully, for their incumbents right. than they do for Congress. Senator McCain likes to say sometimes congressional approval rating is down to paid staff and blood relatives. Uh, and uh, that's a sad place to be. I think people look at Washington and they see the dysfunction and they see big problems that aren't getting solved. And I think the thing that they're perhaps not focused on enough, and maybe they are, maybe I just don't give them enough credit, is leadership and courage. These are, these are problems for which there are solutions, but it takes political courage and leadership in order to address those. And I, frank, and, uh, I know there's a lot of finger pointing back and forth uh, but uh, I think you can tell that I believe 
that the president is the one who could step into that gap. He could provide political cover for Democrats, and Republicans would join him in trying to solve these problems. We don't see that. I think uh, approval rating of Congress and the president would go up if we do that. Senator, so, uh, Senator Coburn, so it would fall to President Obama uh, in some ways to fix the problem of a 12 percent approval rating, I guess. No, I actually wonder uh, what uh, MTV program those 12 percent are watching. Because I can't figure out why we have a 12% approval rating. You think it should be lower? Absolutely. Yeah. So it uh, is relatives, uh, uh, actually, right? Well, no, it's relevant. Think about it. I mean, why do we have 47 job training programs costing $19 billion a year, and none of them have a metric on them, and none of them actually produce trained people to long-term employment? Uh, why do we have 82 federally run teacher training, 82 federally run teacher training programs? with no metrics on it, whether they accomplish anything. The fact is, is we're incompetent because we're not having our eye on the ball. We're not doing the oversight. And going back to the bigger problem, we're in the tank sooner than we think if we don't send a signal that we're on top of our problem. And that's why it doesn't matter. The, the biggest issue with why we have a low approval rating, in my mind, is parochial interest. In other words, we can look good at home because we're protecting the parochial interest, but it, the country's going down the tubes. And, you know, I ran a campaign in 2004 where I said I will not bring one thing to Oklahoma. My opponent thought it was the best thing that ever happened to him. Except you can't have a healthy Texas with an unhealthy Oklahoma, uh, country. And until we start thinking visionary about long term, how do we get out and, and risk our positions to do what is necessary to fix the country, when we do that, that's when the approval rating is going to go up, and rightly so. And until we do that, we're not. That's why Paul Ryan gets elected in a 70% Democratic district every time with 68% of the vote, because he demonstrates the moral courage to speak the truth to the real problems rather than pander, as most politicians do. Senator Vitter, I'll give you the last word, and then we'll open it up for questions. I mean, I, I guess Senator Coburn said you're in, not you personally, but incompetent was the use, word he used to, to characterize Congress. Would you agree? Yeah, I agree with everything Tom said, and a big part of that lack of leadership is way too much attitude of careerism among way too many members in Congress. Yeah. I think that's a huge part of it. Okay. We have about, five, I'm getting five minutes or so for questions. If we have people, we have no microphone set up, but if you wouldn't mind, stand and be heard. Uh, uh, Louis, you get to question almost at every one of these events, and it's always a good question. And it's always a good question, so you go first. Absolutely. My family's building their third restaurant right now. My mom started in 79. My mom started in 79 with $3,000 after my, my father was killed in a traffic accident. I took over in 86, she was doing $500,000 a year and 35 employees. I take myself back there thinking, how could I get from 35 employees to the 200 employees and the $6 million I would have to do in revenues to be able to scale Obamacare, to be able to provide, just pay for the fine. I can't see myself making that step. We've grown the business from $100 in sales to now in the millions. But I don't know how we would have gotten from 500,000 in revenues to 6 million in revenues in one step. I don't know. That's the question. Uh, gentlemen, of course, it's, a, it's constitutional now. So, uh, well, part of it was. Part of it, well, but, you know, what, what, what's... Part of uh, it was unconstitutional. <laughs> what's going to happen going forward with regard to Louis and other small businesses, given the fact that the Supreme Court has ruled... Can, I, can I try that, Louis? Yeah. Louis, I was, in, uh, I was in Tyler yesterday visiting with a number of small businesses. I was in Beaumont the day or two before talking about this whole concept of who built their businesses. And most of them had stories not quite as poignant as yours and your mom's, but very similar in terms of the risks and the sacrifice and uh, reaping the rewards that come along with that and creating jobs and prosperity, not for just for your family, but for the, your employees as well. And they said the thing that causes them the greatest concern about growing their business is the uncertainty they have with regard to taxes, hence the issue of the fiscal cliff. They're uncertain about the regulatory policy of the Environmental Protection Agency that just got uh, slapped, uh, their hands slapped again, I think for the sixth time by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals for overreaching. Um, and then also just the costs of doing business and the President's health care bill was the one 
that, uh, that was causing the most concern. Sam Greenberg's, he sells 200,000 turkeys a year around, uh, around Christmas time. Smoked turkeys from Tyler, Texas. He said his health care costs for next year, he just got the bill, were going up 20%. And so when the president said his health care bill would bring costs down for a family of four of $2,500, uh, that just hasn't proven to be the case. So we can, if we have 51 uh, senators who are willing to, to pass a budget, along with the reconciliation instructions that go along with that, we have a president who's willing to work with us, we can fix the health care plan by repealing that health care plan and doing something along the lines that uh, Senator Coburn discussed earlier, which will make it more affordable, increase access to coverage, and uh, let consumers make those choices rather than Uncle Sam. Yes, sir. I'm Robert Ludicky. I'm a uh, local physician as well as somebody who has a chronic problem with my neck. So until the Affordable Care Act with all its warts was passed, I was uninsurable. Uh, so as I understand it, the only reason I can be insurable with a pre-existing condition is the insurance companies say you have to insure everybody or we can't cover the expense of people with their pre-existing conditions. What is the Republican plan for covering somebody like me? Am I just out of luck? What, what is the plan? Uh, uh, the Republican plan, as far as I'm concerned, is to keep that mandate. Uh, absolutely keep protection for people with pre-existing conditions. There are real problems in health care. I think we should pass individual bills focused on those real problems. People with pre-existing conditions. Uh, a litigation environment that adds so much cost to the system. Uh, the ability that we need to buy health insurance across state lines and dramatically increase choice and competition. So I think the Republican plan is to keep that protection but have targeted reforms that go after real problems, not a 2,800-page bill to remake in one fell swoop one-fifth of the American economy. Uh, well, I want to be sure. Just because we have a limited number of sure. minutes, I want to see if anybody else has a question before we bring this to a close. I see a hand up over there. Sir? We're focused here on the conversation about federal finances and the federal budget, but the federal government rests on 50 states. How does the mass coming shortfalls and unfunded liabilities of municipalities and states affect federal planning? Yes, yeah, Senator Coburn to answer that one. Well, <clears throat> let me just give you an example. We, I, I mentioned job training. I'll just use this for an example. <clears throat> Oklahoma gets $187 million a year from the federal government for job training. And we went in, and I had all of my field reps go to every job training site in Oklahoma, both the ones run by Oklahoma and the federal programs that were run in Oklahoma. Here's what we found. is when a state runs it and controls it, you actually get a, res a, a good result. You have great people work from Oklahoma working for the federal job training programs, but the requirements, the paperwork, the overlap, they all overlap except for three. All 47 overlap. We have one town that has 16,000 people in it, an unemployment rate of 4.5 percent, and has 17 federal job training program offices in the in the, in the city. Now, you think about that. So, <clears throat> how do how do we do it? Let, let's think about what the Constitution says. When it was written, it was designed for a limited federal government, a limited federal government, and the federal government cannot be compassionate. We try all the time. We're well-meaning. Even the people that are t polar opposite to me, they're well-meaning. They love our country. They want to do what's good. But the fact is, is most of the stuff we're not very good at. And so what we need to do is we need to relook as how do we limit the effect and impact both positive and negative of the federal government and what can truly become more of a responsibility for Texas and actually you not quite send quite so much money to Washington because the outcomes in Oklahoma – for job training is about 85 percent of the people that go through a state-run job training program get a skill for life and about 15 percent of the people that go through a federally run job training program a skill for life except we spend one-third the amount on the Oklahoma programs as the federal programs so the closer your government is to you the more accountable it can be there can be fraud there can be all those problems but I think we need to think about a bigger picture I just give you one reference 
There's a great book. He's written by a Texan, a guy by the name of Marvin Olasky. It's called The Tragedy of American Compassion. And when you think about in our compassion and trying to help people, what we've really done is undermine self-reliance. And we put a lid on the potential, the human potential of so many people in the name of trying to help them where I actually have hurt them. So I think bringing things back to local and state control, uh, you know, I trust Texans other than your football teams. I trust you. Uh, <clears throat> And, and I actually think you've proven that you can do things pretty good. You're the number one economic engine of this country, right? You've actually proven it. So you have a track record of being responsible. Let's let, let's, let's let us. Our, I'll make one last point and I'll, I'll shut up. When our country was founded, they created a divided government with a balance of power. But if you really read the writings of our founders, they also created a greater check. The real balance of power was for us to hold the government accountable. And I just tell you, in my lifetime, I've seen my liberty slip away. I'm 64 years of age. And it, it wasn't intentional, but that's the history of republics. They're all dead, right? None of them survive. John Adams said that there's not yet one that hadn't murdered itself. So the point is, is if we want to cheat history, then we have to re-embrace the very principles that made us great in the first place. And whether that's tax policy, education, job training, no matter, health care, whatever it is, if we'll embrace that, the American spirit it will accomplish what is needed for our republic. Senator, with regard to your comment about our football teams, that's okay. We like you a lot better than Bob Stoops anyway. So, uh, 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 Senators, we're going to have to leave it here. We're out of time. Sorry to the people who didn't get to ask questions. We'll turn it back over to Eddie. But please, a very big hand again for our guests, Senator Cornyn, Senator Vitter, and Senator Coburn. Gentlemen, thank you very much. And also a special thank you to our moderator and partner, Evan Smith from the Texas Tribune. Evan, thank you again.